Good evening, everyone. My name is Neil Pandia. I would like to welcome you all to the sixth Cyber Spectrum Meetup. This event serves as a forum for the exchange and knowledge, sorry, the exchange of ideas and knowledge related to software-defined radio, and generally aims to get people interested and excited about the applications that can be realized with SDR technology. Engineers, students, hobbyists, enthusiasts, and people of all experience levels are welcome, no matter what your hardware or software background. At each meeting, people from the community will have the opportunity to present their work, projects, and ideas to the group. The event tonight is being sponsored by Edis Research and is being ho hosted by Noisebridge, a nonprofit hackerspace for technical creative projects. Our first speaker tonight will be Dr. Harvin Samra, who will give a presentation titled OpenBTS, a software defined mobile network. The OpenBTS software is a Linux application that uses a software-defined radio to present a standard GSM or 3GPP air interface to user devices, while simultaneously presenting those devices as <coughs> endpoints to the internet. Thank you, Bob. This forms the basis of a new type of wireless network which promises to expand coverage to unserved and underserved markets while unleashing a new platform for telecom innovation. Harvind is the CTO and co-founder of Range Networks and a graduate of Georgia Tech and UC Davis. Our second speaker will be Jason Abley, who will give a presentation titled Software Defined Radio Without the Radio, Using the New Radio, and a Sound Card to Develop Receiver for Atomic Time from WWVB. He will talk about a do-it-yourself VLF, LF antennas and the history of WWVB and atomic clocks, and demonstrate how to use GNU Radio to turn a cheap SDR rig into a very expensive clock. WWVB is a government-operated radio station that broadcasts from Fort Collins, Colorado, and provides a high accuracy timing signal available from across North America. Jason is an independent consultant and was previously with Edis Research. He is a graduate of The Ohio State University. All meetup presentations will be recorded and posted online, as well as streamed live on YouTube. The previous five events have already been posted in full HD video. We have set up a channel on IRC called Hash Cyber Spectrum on Freenode as a way for people remote people watching the live stream to contact the group here at Noisebridge with comments, questions, or any other audio-visual problems. Future meetup locations will alternate every month between Edis Research in Santa Clara and here in San Francisco. The next meetup will tentatively be on Wednesday, May 27th at the Edis Research office in Santa Clara. A list of speakers and presentations will be posted about a week before the event. If you have any ideas about topics for future talks and presentations, please let us know. We would like to thank all of our speakers tonight for their efforts and their enthusiasm, and we would especially like to thank Noisebridge for providing this space and hosting the meetup here tonight. We would ask that you leave a small donation in the donation bucket by the entrance to help support them. Free pizza, beer, and soda are available of courtesy of Edis Research, so please help, help yourself at any time. The pizzas are on the corner there, and beer and sodas in the back in the fridge. So without any further delay, let's get started. Ball and Sieber will make a few additional announcements and then introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Neil. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I'm just sending out a couple of tweets to let everyone know that we're underway. So thank you and welcome to Cyber Spectrum number six. Yeah, number six. That marks six months since we started. That's pretty, pretty impressive. It feels like it's, it's gone like that. So, who's on IRC? Let's have a show of hands. Who's manning the channels? A couple people? Yep. Any interesting activity? We have a, a patch born brawn entity that is acting like a, a German on there. Is it patch born brawn? Um, it's a great place, though, to communicate with people. People watching remotely will often post questions here, so if you see anybody post a question for the speaker, then just raise your hand or, or yell it out to help those online. Um, again, thanks to Edis Research for sponsoring the food and beer. Hopefully everybody's got some of both. And also Noisebridge for having us again in this excellent hack space. Um, remember, spread the word if you can. Um, I'm trying to let everybody know about what we're doing here and, and um, also encourage people to submit talks. So hop on our meetup page or, or you know, post it in a forum that, that you're with. Remember, it doesn't have to necessarily be specifically about software-defined radio. Software-defined radio touches many other areas like drones, for example, you can see down the front. Um, and maybe if there's time, I'll chat a little bit about that. 
But uh, please, if there's something that you want to talk about, even if it's a project that you haven't really completed yet, or it's something that you would like to learn more about, then get in touch, submit a talk. Uh, remember that on the Meetup page also, you can go to the Pages tab and look at materials that have been posted from previous Meetups. This includes the uh, edited HD recordings, as well as slides that the speakers have presented. Um, and next month we will aim to be back down in the South Bay. So if you follow along at the meetup link or on Twitter, we'll have updates for you there. And tonight, you can follow our speakers on Twitter. Uh, here is Harvin's handle. And unfortunately, someone <laughs> isn't registered on Twitter. So <laughs> unfortunately, those that want to well, Jason's exploits will be, for lack of a better term, SOL. <laughs> Do you think maybe you might register a handle by the end of tonight and we can update the slide? How about that? <laughs> Probably not. Probably not? Okay, fair enough. We respect your, your right to privacy on that. My, my email address. Your email address? Okay, alright, so we'll have an email. That's good. So uh, let's uh, hand it over to our first speaker then. Very happy to have Harvin here. First of all, thanks for having me present to you guys. Uh, or Neil. Can't believe you call me doctor. This. <clears throat> so how many people here have heard of OpenBTS? Out of curious. Okay, how many people have downloaded it and tried it out? <laughs> How many people have run it today? <laughs> <laughs> Does it count if I fail to log in somebody else's open BTS installation tonight? So that's the go to the openbts.org page. That's kind of the best way we can describe open BTS in one sentence. Um, Basically, a Linux application that uses an SDR to operate a base station. If you want to translate it. Um, more specifically, the phones see a cellular network just like they would see an AT&T or Verizon network. Um, but on the inside of it, what, what the phones don't realize is that we're, we've kind of broken away from all the telecom protocols and we do things like SIP and we just go straight to the internet. Um, we make things a lot, a lot simpler. So you can operate these networks in your house, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, you know, for you know, a few thousand dollars instead of traditional equipment, you'd have to do $215,000 would be very difficult to set up. So just to, to you know, translate that, the previous slide into English, well, <clears throat> you know, you know, the cell networks, you know, the first GSM network was designed in the 80s, right? So this is before software eats hardware and all that stuff, back when things were very proprietary. Um, so they made things really complicated. But, you know, when we started this project about seven or eight years ago, it was kind of the realization that, like, hey, we're in the 21st century. All these technologies that still govern telecom are badly outdated. You know, we have the internet, we have VoIP, slash SIP. Um, we started in 2007, 2008, that's when SDRs, actually it's a little couple years before that, when SDRs, you know, the Edis Research USRP came out. You know, we can, you could buy it for, I think it was like $1,200 at the time or something like that. You know, before that, to get a software defined radio was like $25,000. You know, you couldn't, couldn't use it um, without a big budget on it. Um, so given those two things, we decided that you know, TSM networks can be a hell of a lot simpler to build. Um, so I got a couple of illustrations of that to show you. Um, this is a 2G network. Lots of parts, lots of interfaces. Um, you can see how it can be very easy or very difficult to implement or support or sustain. Right? It's rather disgusting. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, we haven't even illustrated all the, uh, the, the, the interfaces. These are just the manual. Um, but 
but you know, working off the slide, what we just you know when we started this project, what we discovered was that you know HLR, which is the Home Location Registry, which is, you know stores subscriber information. Well, we have SQL now, right? Mobile switching center, switch phone calls. We have VoIP, we have Asterisk, we have FreeSwitch, we have all these soft switches. Um, and, and of course, in the BTS, we have the SDRs. Um, just to emphasize it further, this is 2G and 3G combined. Um, way over on the right is an IMS, which is uh, essentially that SIP with a bunch of stuff wrapped around it, just to make it um, work back with a 2G network. So, this is really what OpenBTS is. Um, the internet wants to know if you can stand closer to the microphone. Is that a little better? We'll see if the internet is happy. Okay. Um, it's an open, you know, it's an open source piece of software, which on one side, to the, to the modems or handsets, looks like a cellular network. On the back side, um, for voice, we use VoIP, otherwise, or better known as SIP or RTP. Um, for for data, <laughs> there we go. Um, for data connections, we just go straight to the internet. These things like IP tables and, and, and some basic Linux tools like that. Um, our sort of reference platform we have. We use asterisk initially for the, for the soft switch. Um, we have, a, we have a, a tool called SMQ, which, is, which does uh, basic SMS. Uh, it's a function of an S SMS uh, center, which is basically the stores and, and forwards text messages to and from phones. Um, we have something called SIP officer, which is basically an HLR. It's a subscriber database. Um, so this is kind of a reference model. But the fact that we go to SIP and we go to internet means that that core, instead of being all that gobbledygook of stuff, can be something real simple. So here's another example. Um, some of you guys may know about the 2600 Hertz guys down the street. Um, they have, a, they have a, uh, a nice product called Kazoo, and we've done an integration with them. So instead of using Asterisk, we can use FreeSwitch, and then Kazoo is, you can do all the stuff in Kazoo that we that we previously talked about. So you can have an authorization server, a voice switch, and an SMSC. Um, they call it a message key in this diagram. So it makes the networks much simpler. And it's you know it's in the 21st century. So and you know instead of having guys who are who've been at it for 30, you know, if you want to before if you wanted to operate a network, you needed guys who are in there who have been around for 30 years and knew all the old protocols. Because um, we go to this model. Anybody uses the internet and wants to spend a couple of months can figure this, figure out how to use this. Uh, so Neil thought I should go over the history a little bit, so I thought I'd put this, since I'm in a hacker space, I uh, thought I'd put this uh, slide together. Uh, this was, so we started the project back in 2007 ish, 2008. Um, the first sort of deployment we did was at Burning Man in 2008. Um, it was a great test site because you go out to the desert, you don't have to worry about phones going to at and to your Verizon. They, they, they only see your network, so you have them, they're captive to your network. And you have 50,000 people show up. What a great way to just, to have, you know, you have 50,000 people slamming your network. It's a great way to find bugs and see how it works. Um, so, we, so, you know, it's, it, just two people, me and the, the other co-founder, David Burgess, we, we slapped this together in a couple of months using stuff off of eBay. Uh, so in the middle there, there's a USRP. Uh, this is the, the first edition of the USRP. Uh, connected the USB to a Mac laptop, as you see over there on the bottom right. Um, you'll notice it's on an ice pack, because it was doing all the, all the processing, the DSP and whatnot, um, out in the desert when it's 105 degrees. Um, we started getting weird things like divide by zero errors. <laughs> so the way to keep the, 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 the laptop cool is to put it on a block of ice every day. Um, I was always curious about this because whenever I show my presentations, I always show this photo. 
yeah. being the first sort of real test out there. I was always wondering about the ice. <laughs> it's surprising to me that, that the laptop either wouldn't thermal throttle or just turn off as opposed to keep running and you experience Well, we didn't want it to turn off, right? Because we right. keep the network. Right? But would it have turned off? Or it didn't thermal turn, throttle? No, I don't remember it ever turning off. It just started, we just started seeing weird errors. Purely here. And what, what were you actually running on there at the time? It, it was the first, the, I mean, it was just running Mac OS. Um, it was running the first information <coughs> with the ETS, which was a basic 2G. It was a single carrier 2G installation. You know, it's, it, what we have now is way more optimized. It runs on atoms. I mean, things slower than we have. So, um, you got to remember out there it's 105, 110 degrees. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so we, you know, I don't have a picture of it, but we put it up on a 50 foot tripod and walked all over Burning Man making phone calls. Um, found a lot of bugs too. Um, the interesting thing is when 50,000 people show up and they all try to attach your network, it's like a denial of service attack. So anytime that, you know, anytime the network popped up, we had to wait you know, two to four to five hours till all the phones tried to get on and we kicked them off and, you know, only left the phones that we were wanting to use that had our SIM cards and whatnot. Um, I can't really see in this picture, but there's like an old, there's like some really old archaic cavity filters, like 10 bucks from eBay. Um, you know, there's a, uh, in the back there, there's, there's a power inverter. We had it connected to a wind turbine. Um, I screwed up the wiring in the wind turbine, so I didn't want to uh, We were powering up the car batteries. You can see on the bottom, underneath the table. Um, that's another advantage. It's, just, I mean, you know, it's all software. You just need, you know, a low power computer and a radio. You don't need it. You know, if you look at the, the previous study, we had the HLR and all that stuff. They usually have those things in air-conditioned rooms. Because those things consume so much power. I mean, this, this system, maybe 50, it's like a light bulb, you know, 50 so. um, Did you have to get a special terminal license from the FCC? Yeah, so we, uh, actually David, David was in charge of it the first few years. Um, he, uh, you know, applied for a, what's called a a special temporal authority license. Um, and you tell them, you have to tell them what you're doing, what powers you're transmitting, what frequencies you're going to be on. Um, you tell them you need it for a week. Um, give, you, know, you need about two or three months in advance to, to let the process it. Um, sometimes, I think the first couple of times we did it, that spectrum was actually held by Verizon, so we would call some guy at Verizon and say, Verizon, they use your spectrum out in the middle of nowhere that you never use. And the guy would say, okay, sure. Um, <coughs> So, and I think, you know, I think we put some of the documentation up on the web someplace. Um, lots of other people have, have kind of followed those guidelines to get their own um, licenses for a week here, a month here, uh, about a year. I think somebody's actually got one for a year. I don't know where. Okay. Uh, like I said, we started out in 2008. Um, Tested out Burning Man when we got back, <coughs> launched the website. Um, it was really simple, just basic phone calls and, and using the, the initial USRP. Um, it was kind of amazing when we, when we launched it because we had something like 30,000, I can't remember if it was 30,000 the first day or the first week, but it was just insane. Um, from that point on, the project sort of bootstrapped. You know, a few months later, some guy came in and said, hey, add text messaging, because I want to put text messaging on, on, on a platform. Um, so we just started growing and growing by that, and eventually, you know, by 2011, we had actually built our own, designed and built our own SDR, um, which, was, you know, you know, which was really smaller and specialized for GSM operation. We had added text messaging, and we started doing things like GPRS and UMPS. So we went from, so we went from that, 2008, to actually a little more polished. You know, still prototype-ish, but a lot more polished. But that's a cell network. 2011, it's a cell network. Not just a base station, it's a full blown network. You can run all that stuff on an atom processor. Um, over here in the upper right is our version of the SDR, which was um, basically, you know, it was, it was 
it leveraged a lot of stuff from the USRP. We took some, we made it a little bit simpler. Like the USRP has dual channels, I think it was, but we only needed one. Um, so we could build those things for really low cost, for $300 or $400. Um, <clears throat> we've actually open sourced that radio. So you can go to the openbts.org site and download the Gerber files. It's not just schematics, it's actually Gerber files. And you can go take it to a manufacturing site and they'll make you some radios. Um, so if you're really ambitious, just go to the website. So that's how it's kind of evolved. So what is it? You know, we take a closer look at it. Um, <clears throat> you know, the top part is sort of the SDR part of the uh, of the system. Um, digital radio, anal analog RF part, it, it, it's kind of a combination of SDR and, and some other stuff like cavity filters, or duplexers, or power amplifiers. Um, we have a piece of software called the transceiver, which is responsible for controlling the SDR, sending data to the SDR, and pulling data back from the SDR. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Transceiver talks to a stack that we call open. That's we call that process actually open BTS. Although open BTS is really the whole uh, system. So you know if you if you know telecom stacks, they have they follow the OSI model, right? Layer one, layer layer one's physical, layer two's a link layer, layer three's a network layer. Um, so layer one and layer two follow the GSM spec because we can't control. We can't do anything on the handsets, right? They have chips on them that talk GSM. We can't write software to change what those chips do. So we have to talk GSM to the phones. Um, but once we get to layer three, you know, that's when we can start abstracting away from a lot of the GSM uh, protocols. Um, you know, in this example here, we're just, I'm, I just have voice up here right now, but that's when we start going from a lot of the GSM messaging to SIP messaging. So we use things like SIP register, SIP invite, SIP message, those kinds of things. And that app went on, you're just on an internet backbone. So from, in a way, from the outside world, the phones look like SIP endpoints. Over, um, the phone thinks it's on a GSM network. From the other side, it looks like they're just a bunch of SIP endpoints. Um, so a lot of you would know about it with BTS and assuming you played, played with it. Um, you may know that GSM is in it. TMA-based system, so you have, you know, users are assigned frames and slots and whatnot. Um, so when we design the transceiver, we have to very precise handling of uh, time. So I don't know if there's much on the slide I want to go over. Um, other than illustrating the type, there's TDMA. Question makers. Yeah, how did you um, how did you find packs up and what were you using for time source? Can, can you, how do you time tag? What were you using for time source? Uh, so on our radio, we actually put a, a, a precision DC DCXO. Um, we also had a hook on it so you could use a, a GPS oscillator if you needed to. So, you know, down at layer one, or in the transceiver, we'll, as far as signal processing, what we're looking at, uh, actually these, these four types of bursts, the middle two are actually only on the transmit side, so you just grab the bits and, and modulate them. And some, the top one and the bottom one are, are the ones that we actually have to do some work on, because we actually have to detect them, process them, and, and modulate them. So here's an example, here's a, here's a little more detailed uh, diagram of a normal burst, which is, the main traffic burst in GSM. So in the middle, there's something called the training. Sorry, there's something called the training sequence. Um, a lot of people refer to them as mid ambles. Uh, it's 26 bits in length. There's eight, actually the, the <coughs> specification to, you know, defines eight different sequences, and you pick whichever sequence you want to do when you start up the base station. So the key. The sequences that usually have, they have good correlation properties, they're not great, but they're pretty good. So you can use those to, to estimate 
channel, the, the, the propagation channel, and to help deal with multipath interference or, or reflections. Or even phase something. Uh, the bit rate for GSM is 270.833 kilohertz. 833 going on, it's an irrational number that goes on forever. Um, why they picked that, I have no idea. People ask me that, I don't have an answer for it. So, it means that with the frame structure and the, um, the that, that, that rate, you end up transmitting about uh, 17, I think it works out to about 1,700 slots a second. Um, so we have to be able to process that. Um, so, a little more on, on the physical layer stuff. The modulation is something called Gaussian minimum shift keying. Um, it's a form of continuous phase frequency shift keying with a Gaussian filter. Um, the math is kind of hairy. Um, but it turns out that the little more math turns into a simple GPS casing. So plus one and minus one um, with a simple frequency shift. And then you put on a, a, it's called a Gaussian pulse shape to keep the spurious emissions low, and they keep the inner symbol in the um, makes, makes the processing much simpler, so it's a lot easier to do with an SDR, and do the processing off the shelf CPU. Um, our approach in using an SDR is actually to keep the SDR really simple. Um, sorry, you know, I like the joke, we wanted the radio to be as stupid as possible. So, we don't, we, we designed it so that we didn't have to do any, or as, as little signal processing as possible on the radio. So, in essence, you know, what I, what I like to say is that the radio is really like a souped up A to D, D to A converter. Um, it gets sample, it gets, you know, it gets samples, converts them to analog, you know, goes to the D to A converter and then transmits it, up converts them to the, you know, 850, 900 megahertz, or 1800, 1900 megahertz. Okay, um, conversely, receives stuff that those RF frequencies runs it through an A to D, sends it back up uh, to the to the host CPU. We didn't want it doing any kind of filtering or any kind of uh, signal processing. Um, that way, you can plug and play with a lot of different SDRs. If we start relying on the SDR to do actual signal processing and then we get into a situation where we're locked into one or two SDRs. So if you download the code and you look at uh, the transceiver process, um, you'll see all this stuff in C++. And, and I put together put together this diagram to kind of illustrate the architecture of the system. Um, so I got, you know, in the previous slide we had OpenBTS, which was like sort of layer two, layer three-ish. It also does some of the stuff in layer one. Uh, multi frame multiplexing and forward error correction, coding and decoding. Uh, everything, you know, transceiver is responsible for sort of the RF uh, signal processing. Um, in this example here, we actually have uh, five we're called five carriers, or five RF pins. Um, so in GSM, every you know, there's also an F a frequency multiplexing scheme where you can um, put signals on different carriers with different frequencies. Um, so in this instance here, we have five carriers that are adjacent to each other. They're separated by about 400 kilohertz each. Um, <coughs> so we have what we did. We have threads that control. Uh, each carrier. Um, on the right there, they're, they're labeled with the, the letter C. So each, those threads are responsible for tuning the transmit and receive frequency, the, the, the transmit and receive gains. Um, but those are the two main things that they do. It's basic control logic. Um, the M stuff is, is stuff labeled M, which is right in the middle there. That's for uh, modulation. So, uh, open BTS will, sit, will generate the necessary bursts, send them down to uh, to those modulation threads to be modulated on those carriers. So the modulation, I'll get into it a little bit later. I noticed down there, uh, 
when you're talking about quote, over the over UNSD unquote and the stack required in the particular levels three or two or even one? Um we do two or three. Two or three is okay. Yeah. We actually do Ethernet uh, as well. With, with the uh, like USRPN two hundred. Somebody else raise their hand. So, on the next slide here, I have the uh, more what goes on below the, uh, the radio interface. So, the radio interface is sort of this, the abstraction layer between open between the transceiver and the SDR. Uh, so, if you go below it. That's where we get into the USB drivers or Ethernet drivers. Um, in this case, uh, you know, this is the diagram for, for our radio um, using a USB 3.0 interface. Um, the idea, like I said before, is that we wanted to keep the radio simple. So really, you know, other than just sending streaming data to and from the radio, um, all we try to do are things like interpolate and decimate because the radio sampling rate may not, in fact, usually does not actually match the GSM sampling rate. Right? Um, so we ask that the radio deal with interpolation and decimation sampling rates. And, um, we control the transmit receive frequencies, the transmit and receive gains. Uh, we can calibrate the clock on the radio, um, in this instance with, the, with our radio. And then that's it. Um, we try to minimize the amount of work that we have to radio to do. So the signal processing, if you go back to this deck, to the, on the left there are the demodulation threads, which actually have most of the signal processing system. Um, they work on a burst by burst and by a per carrier basis. So the radio receives all five carriers at once and then multiplexes them and soft, you know, passes it up to, to, to the transceiver and the transceiver uh, demultiplexes each one of those and this isolated carriers and they get passed up to, to a carrier thread. And like I said before, there's five of them here. So the demod thread is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we talked, show the diagram of the mid amble that comes uh, in each time slot. So you go ahead and run a correlator over it. It gives you an estimate of the channel response and phase and amplitude and whatnot. Um, depending on what, what comes out of the correlation, you need to just do a simple phase or amplitude correlation uh, compensation, which is you know, basically a multiply operation. Or something more advanced. It, in OpenBTS, we use uh, something called a decision feedback equalizer. Um, there's tons, it's been around for a long time, there's tons of algorithms out there. Um, yeah, so, you know, the other equalization algorithms that people can implement if they want to. So, once we're through with the equalizer, we pass the soft, um, what are called soft bits or soft outputs, which are one or minus one. Yeah, I was going to ask about the uh, the DFB. Uh, could you comment on the selection of that one versus some other methods like uh, Viterbi or something like that on the equalization? Like why DFB specifically? Uh, well, I think we went with the DFB because it was simpler. Mm -hmm. um, Viterbi can get computational. Yeah, okay. Um, and from what we found, uh, we got pretty good. We got a good trade off between computation and performance with the CPU. But you know, you're right, you can do something with Turby, you can do something with uh, zero force and equalizer, those kind of things. Um, but one of the neat things is that from out of the equalizer, we send up soft bits. You know, instead of a one or a zero, we send up probabilities of the bits into, a, into the forward error correction decoder. And we're able to get actually really good performance better than, than you would if you just send up hard information. And it turns out it's actually, what we found is actually in, in the industry, there's a lot of stuff that's done with hard bits. 
but it's set up to zero or one. It'll set up the probabilities and, and lose a lot of information on performance going on. Um, so that's one of the neat side effects of doing things in software with the implement on algorithms that are using other people. And so I'm going to move on to 3G since um, that's kind of that's more of the predominant standard around the world these days. Uh, so you know, GS, it, if you look at 3G, it, you can sort of describe it as being GSM with an entirely different physical layer. Um, it's kind of an open simplification because it, you know, it's only an hour long talk, but. That's the way to look at it. It's you know the the, the voice and texting, all the all the, the signaling and the messages and the logic and all that stuff is identical to GSM. It's just done over an entirely different media access scheme and a different modulation demodulation type. So 3G, we get away from TDMA and GMS. Can we do something called wideband CDMA or WCDMA? Uh, even though we don't have TDMA, we still define frames, just like you do in, in the internet with packets. Um, the frame size can change between 10 to 20 to 40 million milliseconds. Uh, most, most, uh, use, most times in, in 3G, you only use 10 or 20 milliseconds. I don't really know anybody who uses 80 milliseconds. Um, frames still have a slot structure, just, just to make process, processing easy, so they still have 15 slots. Um, we get away from from a BPSK and get to, some, get to QPSK modulation for 3G. When you get to 3.5G, you start doing things like 16 clamp and 64 clamp. So you get a higher data rate between <coughs> IRS and RS when you do that. Um, the uh, data rate or the chip rate in 3G is 3.84 megahertz. So you're from, you go from GSM, which is 270 kilohertz, to, to 3.84 megahertz. So it's, it's, you know, it's like a factor of 13 increase in, in, in uh, throughput. So, I'm not, you know, those of you who aren't familiar with how CDMA works, the idea is that you have, you have a bit sequence of ones and zeros, you convert them to ones and minus ones. You multiply each bit by something called a pseudo noise sequence or pseudo noise code. Um, but so each bit expands to an n-bit sequence. So you go from a so you're you're increasing the bit rate by a factor of n. And what happens is that the signal power gets spread out over a much larger bandwidth. So it almost looks like white noise. And it makes it much more interference tolerant. And what they figured out is that this could also be an access scheme. So if you give different if different phones or different users are assigned different codes, they can all share the same frequency. They can all be transmitting and receiving at the same time. Because uh, they all look like noise to each other. If you design the codes properly, uh, all the, you know, the signals that are spread by other codes than the one that's assigned to you just look like noise when you're done. So it, it's actually really, it was actually a really clever um, scheme for for a, for a communication system. Uh, actually, it turns out though that it makes processing a, a hell of a lot more complicated. So, uh, so that's spreading, and then there's another feature in, in 3G called scrambling, where you just take once you spread the signal up by a factor of n, you just multiply that by, a, or you XOR it by a, another new a pseudo noise sequence. To understand those two concepts, uh, the modulation is actually really simple. You take your bits, you convert it to QPSK, so you have some on the imagine, you know, on the I channel and half on the Q channel. You spread them by some factor, depending on what data rate you want to transmit at. If you, you know, if, you're, if you need to send 64 and 63, I think it's more like, if you want to send like 96, uh, mega uh, kilobits a second, or 960 kilobits a second, you need to use a spreading factor of four. If you want to do something much slower, you use a much better, bigger spreading factor. Right? Um, once you spread them, 
to scramble them and transmit them. Now it's different depending on whether you're doing the downlink or the uplink. So in 3G, on the downlink, there's only one scrambling code for all transmissions. So they all share the same scrambling code. But their transmissions are distinguished by giving by assigning users different spreading codes. So one phone will be assigned one spreading code to listen to, another phone will be assigned another spreading code to listen to. Um, and that's how the downlink's handled. On the uplink, it's flipped around a little bit. Uh, they all use the same spreading codes, but each phone is you know, each phone is told to transmit using a different scrambling code. So the, the processing kind of works in, in a different order when you do that. Um, not that it came out too long, well, but that's kind of a, a simple diagram of, of how that works. The, the spreading codes are formally called normalization <coughs> codes or orthogonal variable spreading factor codes in the spec. Um, so uh, over here on the left, uh, DP, the DPDCH and the DPCCH are, are the data and control channels for for a, for a phone. And we converted the QPSK. Um, well, first they're spread, then they're converted to QPSK, then they're scrambled, and then they go through a root raised cosine filter to, to shape it um, and induce inner symbol interference, and then they're transmitted. So on the, on the, on the back side, you've got to do the same thing. So first you've got to run it through another root raised cosine filter to eliminate the ISI. You descramble it by basically multiplying it, multiplying what you receive by uh, the, it's called the complex conjugate. Of the, of the scrambling code or the scrambling code. Um, then you despread it. Um, so, what's not in this diagram is that on the, on when you receive these things, you have to, as you do with GSM, you have to deal with reflections. Uh, so, you, know, you can again use something like a, a, a decision feedback equalizer or a turbo equalizer. But what you find in 3G a lot of times is because the data rates much larger, um, and you're sampling, correspondingly, you're sampling at a much larger rate. You'll have a lot of, uh, when, you estimate, when you correlate against the pilot sequences that are in the waveform, you'll end up finding out that there's a lot of uh, zeros in the channel response. You don't want to use a traditional equalizer because you end up wasting a lot of computation. You end up multiplying by zero a lot. Um, so in, in UMTS, they have, they have something called a rate receiver, which is kind of clever, actually. What they end up doing is, once they estimate the channel, and they know where the reflections basically are, they, you know, you, you take all the reflections and you add them together coherently to try to get a stronger signal. Um, I don't have a diagram of it here, but it's actually a really clever thing. I would encourage you to go take a look at it after this talk. Um, unfortunately, it's also really computational. Um, these are, uh, the way that it usually works is that you end up, you, uh, you're, you're despreading all the, the different reflections at the same time before you add them up. And that can get really computational, computationally intensive. Um, so one other thing about 3G, and Neil can vouch for me that I complain about this all the time, is that you have this thing called the near-far problem. Because the phones are sharing the same frequency and, the, and they're transmitting and receiving at the same time, they're, they're separated by these codes, you can get something called the near-far problem, which is a phone that's close to the base station and transmitting at a certain power will drown out some phone that's at the edge of the, of the, of the cell coverage, right? So in 3G, you do it in 2G a little bit too, but in 3G, you have, you have to do something called fast power control. So what you have to do is the phone that's close to the base of change to turn its transmit power down, and the phone far away, you tell it to, to ramp up as much as it can. Um, and this is where something like having access to an SDR is really, really neat, because you can get in there, you can look at signal, you know, signal strength, you can look at signal quality, and, and make up, come up with all these really nice algorithms to, to control the power of the phone to get the best performance for the, all the phones in the network. 
Um, traditional, if you're not, if you're not using an SDR, you're using like a fixed chipset. You can't get into the, those that kind of information to really develop an algorithm. You just have to go with whatever they developed on the chip or in, in the uh, firmware. Um, and then you can do other things like look at the data rates of the phone. If one phone's got a voice call and another one's doing a data download, well, the phone doing a data download you know, have lower priority than the one that's doing voice. You know, it gets a higher priority because it has to be more real time. So you can you do all these kind. Of, so the, all these things go into go, come together to an algorithm, and having an SDR approach is is really valuable. Um, so I mentioned we started the, the project back in, in 2008 um, and we saw the, uh, the Kluge Home Depot network that we took the Burning Man. Um, but slowly and slowly, you know, the project and, and, and sort of the community has evolved to the point now that we're actually doing honest to God, real network deployments using SDRs. Um, so one of the best examples I like to talk about are these two islands off the coast of Newfoundland. They actually belong to France, uh, called Saint Pierre and Miquelon. So this guy, run, this guy runs a, a VoIP uh, service over there. It's, there's an incumbent carrier over there that charges people like five minutes. Of, I, you know, I don't know exactly, but three minutes, five minutes, five, three dollars, five dollars a, a minute on a phone call. And he saw this huge opportunity. He's like, I can, I can go come in here with a much lower cost system and gut these guys. Um, so we've worked with them for several months now and it's got actually six towers up using uh, range networks, uh, gear running over BTS, um, using range networks SDRs. And he's able to cover the entire town. He started this, he started service back at the end of November. And then last time I talked, we talked to him again about three or four weeks ago, he was already up to a thousand subscribers. I mean, you know, he's just stealing, because he's able to offer services like at one tenth the cost that the incumbent is. Um, and you know, it helps the fact that he's a void, and he runs a void server, so he, he knows asterisk, he knows soft switches, he knows how to deal with all that stuff. He knows how to get phone numbers, he knows how to do all that stuff. And this allowed him to set up a network, you know, for less than, less than six figures in, in cash. And you know it's it's doing very well. It's thriving. Um, upper left, that's a storefront. It just looks like a T-Mobile store. Or something. <laughs> uh, it's all in French because, like I said, it's a French, France, the French territory. Um, there's two of our two of our base stations that are um, in Iraq, and I don't know if that's him or one of his um, employees up on a tower mounting an antenna. Um, that looks back to these. It covers the it covers the entire building. Yeah. Again, what was that? The capital outlay for establishment. So, so I don't know exactly. You were saying a few thousand, or you were saying. Oh, like, it, well, I, I can tell you, it's, it was probably less than six figures. And I, well, less than six. Yeah. Uh, got a question. So, um, with the two providers there, how, how do people select to be on one? Do they have to buy the phone, or is it a setup? Um, they, uh, they buy the phone from him, and, and, you, and buy the SIM cards from him. So you program the SIM card properly, it'll prefer one network over the other. So this program that it prefers his network over the incumbent network. And of course you can go in their manual. You know, most phones you can go in the settings manual and you can tell which network you want to use. Not as convenient, but you can always do that. So he actually, so he actually got the spectrum from the French government to do this. And, you know, and, but even though he got spectrum, it was still kind of a hairy situation because across the water is Newfoundland, which is Canadian territory. Well, the band allocations are different between the two countries. Okay. France, GSM is in 900. Canada, GSM is in 850. So he's setting up service in 900, but Canada 900 is full of green transmissions and all this other garbage. 
Um, so we actually had to do some tweaking with the SDR to, to knock out the interference to get him the coverage that he needed. Uh, so again, another really neat thing to have an SDR for is that you can change these things on the, you can see that there's weird interference in the area, you can change what frequency you want to transmit on it. You can do some additional processing, you can do some software upgrades and you can deal with the interference. So this is more of a, a technical diagram of the, of the setup. So you have six nodes, and everything's done over the internet. You, know, you don't see any HLRs, MSCs, or any of that stuff in here, right? It's just, it just looks like an internet network, or an ethernet network. But it's, it's a cell network, it's a full-blown cell network. Um, a couple more examples, here's another one. This was actually a few years ago. Uh, these guys in Antarctica wanted a uh, they wanted a cell network. When it's actually the Australian division, Australian Antarctic division. It's on an island called Macquarie Island. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But, um, it's Antarctic, and they wanted a, a network where they could walk around the base and call each other. They couldn't go with traditional equipment because, uh, for example, uh, what happens is that. And, you know, they have traditional guys in, the, in these kinds of situations. They have the HLR and the MSC on the other side of the satellite link to do all the switching and, and control, call control and all that. Well, these guys, the satellite goes out all the time. You know, the satellite goes out and they use that equipment. They can't make phone calls at all. Uh, with our approach, because we actually have the, you know, the soft switch in the box, Calls don't ever have to leave the island. The calls can be routed, at least calls within the network can be routed locally. You know, we, the satellite goes down, we don't care. As long as you're calling each other on the island, it's fine. And that was a huge advantage. Uh, one more example that uh, I want to go over it is a company in Iceland they actually made a rescue. Uh, a rescue solution here, where they they basically run a base station at the, at the bottom of a helicopter when they, when they can't find something, they fly around. You know, they transmit and the phone sees it and it starts responding to the base station and they're able, they fly around and can triangulate the position of the phone. Um, again, the reason they can do that with our system is because we're SDR, we can get in there and get down to the waveform and give them all this really cool information that you couldn't do. With the, with the proprietary, you know, baked system. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if they've saved anybody yet with it, but it works really well and it, it, it's gained a lot of traction. So I wanted to uh, finish with one, one more slide here, just where does all talk about OpenBTS and, and software-defined radios and soft, doing everything in software. Uh, is this going anywhere? Is this something that's catching steam? And it actually is. Uh, you know, I think most, almost every carrier and operator on the planet has gotten to the point where they know Open BTS. And, you know, we'll talk to somebody and they're like, I haven't heard of Open. We'll talk to some VP or something. I haven't heard of Open BTS. We say, go talk to your CTO and like a week or two later. He's like, oh, yeah, we're using it. We're using it in our lab to do this and that. And it works pretty well. Um, so it's gone from, you know, Home Depot project at Burning Man to something that's actually gaining traction and being used by real operators and real care. Um, plus these guys are starting to realize that all, you know, this, the telecom is like maybe the last industry that hasn't figured out that software eats hardware. You know, they still do all these things, proprietary hardware, proprietary solutions. You know, you have to buy a server full of junk just to have one simple network. Um, the, the carriers, I think, get to a point where they're kind of they're tired of it. They see people, they see like data centers. You know, it used to be you had to go buy proprietary, you had to go buy a server that had all the software already installed in it. Well, now you go to Dell, you get a server, you go download whatever you need, you install it yourself, and now you have a data center. You know, that's what they want to do for for networks. And the software approach allows them to do that. And SDRs are, are an important part of it. They have, you know, they have a technology 
in telecom called remote radio. That's just kind of funny. And we'll talk to people about SDRs and like, what's an SDR? And we'll tell them an SDR. It's like, oh, that's a remote radio pedal. So they're already they're already starting to go down this route where they just have really simple software to find radios out in the edge and they put everything, all the other stuff, on a server or on software. Drops their operating costs way down and allows them to do innovation because it's all software. So they, you know, another thing they're getting filled on are over the top apps. You know, they're they're, they're being used as just dumb data pipes. They don't have any services on the other side of it, and they can't get to it because they, you know, they're using Huawei or Eric's and stuff that they can't get into. They can't understand how it works because it's so complicated. Well, with approaches like this, where it's just software, you can get in, and it's just internet, it's SIP, and all this stuff, you can get in there and start linking in things. You can set up your own Twitter thing, you can set up your own WhatsApp type of application, you can do all that kind of stuff. So, it, you know, it's, it's taken a few years, but I think it's starting to actually dawn on these guys, and they're starting to get really excited that SDRs and software-defined approaches are really the way to go here. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you for listening to me. Um, the project has a website, openbds.org. We have a mailing list. Uh, you can go download the software. Uh, like I said, you can download an SDR, basically, if you want to build one and play with it. Um, we have licensing agreements, so if you want to work with the code and you come up with some obscure phone that nobody's ever seen before and it doesn't work, and figure out some bug with it, you can contribute it back to the project. Or at least tell everybody about it. Or uh, the SDR plans, which are thus available, would, uh, uh, <coughs> would performance level include uh, uh, a full duplex? Yes. And, it's uh, a full duplex right now. Full duplex and uh, what kind of sample sizes? Eight versus higher bits? Uh, 16 bit. High and 16 bit. Any questions, comments? Criticism? How old is the data work? If I have a cell phone that has a 3G radio, what data links do I get? Uh, you get enough to watch a YouTube video. Is it? Is it HSPA? No, it's not. It's, it's right now. It's just UMTS. HSPA is on the roadmap. Cool. So, but UMTS is actually enough that you can watch a YouTube video, but you can't have like a hundred people watching a YouTube video on the same. Right. UMTS uses a lot of error bandwidth to get effective throughput of error clock. Right. And HSPA, the HSPA, they go to uh, that's when they, they go from QPSPA to 16 point 64 point, so they can get to a much higher data rate. It's almost, I mean, it almost gets to the point where it's almost LTE. Right. You were mentioning uh, the uh, CDMA and uh, the fact that that's a way for uh, users to uh, share uh, the two frequencies that per user is in the receive. Yeah, actually, yeah, that is the point. The downlink and uplink are on, so they're still in separate bands. And so, with the state of the art there, uh, uh, but what kind of uh, Bits, uh, uh, bits per second data, uh, would that be supporting? Um, the target is 384 kilobits a second per phone, which is YouTube video quality, basically. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, we should thank our speaker. Very much, Harvard. And while we do a quick um, speaker change to Jason, if I can do a bit of a, a shameless plug, I've been doing this so often lately. Um, OpenBTS has actually been running on this E310 here, and it's actually powered off a battery pack. So this this little portable compact thing is running all the software that Harvard's been talking about. And if you want to actually try it out now, you can. If you get your mobile phone out and you go to manual carrier selection mode, you'll see a network there that doesn't actually belong. And then you can you can log on and and call and and text. I might turn my phone around. Yeah, that's right. 
Um, so it's just so cool that all this work that's been done can, can run on all sorts of different platforms and even on something so compact and portable. So um, with that, let's just take a moment um, and let Jason set up in preparation. It was interesting how you mentioned the base station on the helicopter because you know we can run it on the E310 now. And one thing I've been doing at work is actually putting the E310 on this drone as the payload. <laughs> so you could, I mean, I've, I've done some other things, but you can conceivably run OBS on here and then actually have your own mobile airborne base station with this sort of a, an aerial platform. So stay. I love I love using this kind of this content. Stay tuned. Get it? <laughs> oh. Thank you for that applause. I'm Jason Otley. I guess I'm here to show you an early stage project that I'm working on. Um, hopefully it hasn't been oversold too badly. But uh, basically, although software radios are cheap, I think there's a lot that people can do to get started playing with the radio and uh, software defined radio without having to make even as much investment as going all the way down the road of buying specific SDR hardware. Um, in fact, your sound card can give you access to a lot of things without much extra hardware at all. So anyway, so today the thing I really wanted to talk about is looking at WWBB, uh, which is, um, we'll talk a little more about it, but it's a, it's a source of time information that's broadcast out there and covers the entire US. There's actually other ones that cover Europe and Japan, and it's a new, very similar format broadcast uh, run by their national governments. Um, talk about why I'm interested in the WWBB, beyond just time, what else can we get out of it? Uh, we'll talk about how you go about receiving it with a sound card, uh, and then get, work our way a little bit through what I've done with the radio towards building a uh, software-based uh, modulator for WWBB. So just to be straight and upfront with everyone, um, I like interactive, so definitely interrupt me. Um, don't you know? Don't leave your questions to the end. And also, this is relatively new material for me, so if I got something wrong. Let me know. You know, I, I definitely would rather hear about it sooner than later anyway. So definitely um, looking for feedback. Things that didn't happen for this talk that I hoped for. I was planning to have a live reception here, um, or at least have a recording of my own report. Things didn't go my way with the antenna and things like that. So we don't have that. I have a different recording of it, and we'll work through that. But I apologize for that. Um, also, you know, no big fancy antennas to show you and that kind of thing. So this is still very much something I'm playing with and I would invite collaborators and feedback. Also, this is not nearly as complex as this is the hardware is working on. This is, the, this is a very simple thing. So uh, it should be hopefully something that's approachable to everyone. Uh, so anyways, what is WWBB? Uh, WWBB is run by the uh, National Institute of Standards. It broadcasts time code information on 60 kilohertz. Um, it's you know, a fairly powerful transmitter. It's actually two of them that each output around a little over 50 kilowatts apiece, and with their efficiency, they end up with 70 kilohertz of radiated power out of four columns, which is designed to be sufficient so you can receive it all across the lower 48 states. Um, this, time, this is actually the time source that's behind a lot of the commercial atomic wall clocks that you see out there. Um, there's nothing to do with atomic with them, other than that obviously MIST has its own traceability back to its, its own atomic time sources. Those are just really radio controlled clocks, and that's actually what NIST would prefer to have them called, but you know, atomic sounds better for marketing. Um, I think NIST says they think there's about 50 million of these things between wristwatches and, and wall clocks and stuff out there, which is pretty impressive. Um, one thing to note is most of them are poor enough receivers that they actually don't receive except for at night. Um, and so they'll just pick a time in the night and synchronize it. So for those of you who've done work with radios before and looked at hold times and, in, in, uh, in, you know, like hold errors and in, in PLLs like that, it's not really going to hold time that well. I think this asks people to get to within 0.2 seconds um, of hold time over the course of a day when you can sync at night. Um, so most of the time code stuff is aimed at people who just want to have a wall clock that sets its time and they don't have to think about it harder than that. Um, but there's a lot of other cool things you can do with it, and we'll talk a little about that later. Anyways, another thing that's kind of neat about it is it actually predates GPS. It's been on the air since 1963. 
um, and it's, it's still going strong. They actually just recently updated it. We'll talk about some of the changes they made to it recently. Uh, so why am I interested in WWDB? I'm interested in it because, well, I'm on a hobby project. I want something where I can dabble around in digital comms and new radio a little more. And this is something that didn't seem like anybody else has done a, a good implementation of a WWDB receiver. So that's, that's, a, that's my main interest in it. Um, there's kind of two main um, two main time codes broadcast by WWDB. One of them being yeah, like an AM to PWM kind of thing, where they just literally use um, the amplitude of the carrier. They reduce it by 70, 17 dB to kind of indicate the start of a bit and how long it stays reduced. We'll talk a little more about that. And then recently in 2013, they put a BPSK overlay onto it to give them. A, a little better reception at distance, um, and given the ability to put some extra messages in there. And I haven't actually even begun to scratch the surface of the UPS case. So it's on my list, but it's down the road. Um, I'm also interested in learning more about uh, exactly how all this works with the antennas and atmospheric propagation, things like that. Uh, 60 kilohertz, an interesting thing about it is it actually doesn't propagate nearly so much through the atmosphere as through the ground, through the kind of first the upper layer of the soil which is kind of neat, um, which leads to interesting things where you can receive this in basements, uh, where GPS, good luck receiving GPS in a basement. Uh, also, the other thing, another thing that does affect it, though, is the, the condition of the atmosphere is, is, a, is a big player in this, uh, to the point that it has massive fades at sunrise and sunset as the ionosphere changes. It has, uh, it'll actually, to some extent, the, the, you can think of like the ionosphere and the ground as a capacitor. And the further up the ionosphere goes, the less capacitance, or as it comes down closer, the more capacitance. And that'll change properties of the WDB signal. Um, there's also things like lightning strikes or meteorites hitting the atmosphere. There's a number of groups out there doing research into tracking those by watching phase shifts in WWDB. Uh, so those are all things that I'm interested in playing with eventually. It's not like that yet. Um, another thing that people use, have used this for is as an accurate frequency reference. And this claims that in averaging and everything, you can get down to parts per trillion kind of level with, uh, with the, uh, the uh, frequency uncertainty in, in the movie. So that's you know, nothing to sneeze at. How, how long would you need to average for to get that kind of uh, resolution? I think most people are averaging like day kind of holdovers because the, the biggest thing you have, you have to um, account for. Over the course of the day, you're going to just have propagation delay changes as the ionosphere changes. So, um, so the, the, it's it's a fair bit of averaging. It's not it's not the kind of thing that you just turn on and works quite as fast as and you, you can come into lock on the GPS signal faster than that. But this you can run in your basement. So my plan was to receive this directly using the. Some of the modern sound cards offer uh, 192 kilohertz uh, sampling rate, which if you're looking for a 60 kilohertz signal, it's you know, well within your night's range, you can just do direct sampling. Uh, unfortunately, mine turned out to be 48 kilohertz, and also didn't really bring, uh, you know, it couldn't really alias it in either. It wasn't, it wasn't aliasing in well for me, so I have to get a different sound card before I can just go with that. Um, However, I've seen plenty of people out there on the internet who've succeeded with these or even built little micros doing that kind of thing. You know, there's a pick microcontroller out there. Um, so also, uh, things, things I started down the road at was looking at how to do resonant loop antennas. You can basically think of these as, as you know, kind of a, a transformer that's, that's set with its primary to resonate at 60 kilohertz and then its impedance transforming is something reasonable to go into your sound card. So CMAX, for example, makes uh, a little commercial module on a, on a ferrite rod like this, and a number of people have made homebrew and kind of shielded coax uh, loop antennas like this. Uh, these things are usually deep in diameter, this area helps you. Although, even though these things are still electrically small relative to, you know, say, 60 kilohertz is what 16 kilometers or something like that were made by. So you're not going to build a, 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 a quarter weight antenna. Uh, but yeah, so I went down the road of, of building some of these, but again, nothing to show for that.
that interest, what's in them? You can really miniaturize things like watches. Can you ever take one apart to look? Yeah, so, so CMAX actually makes a line of very small, like it's, a, it's a basically, it looks a lot like this, but it's just, it's just a small um, ferrite rod that's wrapped like that. Um, I, I would definitely like to get a hold of a watch itself. I mean, they make watch modules if you go to their website and um, see them, but it's, it's not terribly impressive to look at it that way. Definitely, you need to tear one apart. Um, so anyway, so how am I going to work through this? Um, well, the nice thing is there's uh, th this guy who's fortunately uh, provided a nice recording of WWDB for me, so even though my receiver isn't up to stuff yet, uh, he put together quite the impressive stack of things <laughs> to pull in WWDB, which produces a really nice recording, so it makes my life easy for development. Um, and that's, that's just kind of the file that I'm going to start from show off a little of how you do this. Uh, but yeah, you can read his website if you're interested in more details on exactly what he did there. But at the end, he's recording it on his sound card. He's just giving a really nice art from it. So this is what uh, this provides for the old AM uh, WM format uh, of time code. It's basically one bit per second for 60 seconds. So there's no need to give a minute or a second reference. It just gives you minutes, hours, day, day of the year, and the year itself. Um, because basically at the end of each of these frames is zero seconds for that minute. It's one bit per second and 60 bits. Um, we can uh, break it down a little more into how exactly this AM PWM stuff works. Basically, they've got a carrier and they have a position bit that shows you the start of a 10 bit sequence. Uh, which is basically they lower their signal. This is, this is actually coming off my recording. The, um, they, they lower the, si the signal strength of the carrier by 17 dB for 0.8 seconds and then bring it back up. It's so always a bit start signal with the lowering of the, uh, the carrier signal strength and then it's how, when it restores the carrier signal strength that tells you what's, what the symbol is. The zero is low for 0.2 seconds and then high for the, the remaining 0.8. 3 actually, I guess it's, yeah, it's 0 0.3. 0 0.2 seconds. So 0 0.2 seconds low and restore for the remaining 0 0.8. And a 1 is low for half of a second, uh, a second and high for half a second. So it's a very simple modulation scheme. Uh, and then similarly, to get your overall frame start and end, they put one of these position bits at the end, and then there's another one that happens at the start. So when you see two of those back to back, that gives you the the way to synchronize on the start of the frame. So overall, like I said, it's 60 bits um, that includes minutes, hours, the day of the year. This is interestingly all done as um, binary code decimal, so uh, don't know quite why they chose that, but it makes it easier for them to read out, I guess. Uh, and a little bit of stuff about whether it's daylight savings time and whether we need a second to apply. So that's kind of the, the main presentation part. And then I have the actual, um, this, uh, work in progress receiver. What window manager are you running? Uh, I3WM. It's a tiling window manager. So I spend enough time in a text window that it actually makes it a little interesting every time I have to come back and do something fairly practical like this. OK, so this is just kind of um, my flow of thinking about how to start building up a receiver for this. And basically the idea here is we've got this wave file, which would otherwise be our, our sound card, it's pulling in our samples. Um, I gave myself the ability to run a little faster than real time so that it's easier for me to uh, work through debugging stuff. And that's why the throttle's in here, actually with a variable in the controls, whether I'm running in real time or, or faster than real time. And so that last plot you just saw is basically just 
going to channelize it down to uh, about a one kilohertz bandwidth and pull out my interesting, uh, yeah, my preferred uh, carrier there. Running this, and after a second, it syncs up. You see, this is just where we've pulled out kind of the, the, uh, the carrier there. So, Disable the complex of flow. So now this I want it slower. So disable this for just a second. This look like an improvement to domain. Which one are we going for? This one. I'm just going to change this default so it's not the wrong place. Here, twice a Okay. So this is this is an after channel. This is where I've channelized it, brought out just my WWDB carrier here. Um, then what I was going to show you is it. If we apply that costless loop, the nice thing that this will do for us is pull in our frequency, so we take out our frequency error. You can actually watch it walk it right in. <laughs> Have it nice. That's a really cool way of visualizing that. So basically now that we have it at one kilohertz and it's centered, we can take and uh, further uh, basically decimate it down to uh, 10 samples per second.
this is after we've cleaned it up through slicing. And then finally we want to find um, the start of our the start of a frame that is basically this is the start of the frame code. Once it gets enough bits to fill the screen for us, let's see. So, let's see that it's pulling in, and it's got, you can see the, the end of the, the, basically here's a position bit followed by a position bit that, that marks the start of a frame. And so then these would be our minute code, our hour code. And our day of the year code and so on and so forth. And so that's about where I've gotten so far with this. Um, the next thing is obviously to break this up into individual frames and I'll get a tag and start pulling out the actual time data from each of those individual 10 bit sections. And then turn it into an NTP server? <laughs> Probably something like that. I was imagining something like. Uh, Eventually, and now that we've got GNU Radio running on Android devices, I was thinking of making the most expensive uh, atomic clock. <laughs> yep, that's, that's the basic idea. Any questions? Any comments? I'd love to have people who want to collaborate on this. So, you mentioned the BPSK like, kind of addition. So, mm -hmm. what, what does that add? Or what new information is that kind of bringing up? What does it bring about? Well, so I haven't dug real deep into it yet. Um, the biggest thing I think is that there's the claim that it will get you um, better, kind of better reception range. You know, you'll, you'll get, um, you, should, you should get a better, um, I'm missing the term, but anyways, you should be able to do, to actually receive WWDB successfully at like, under worse signal conditions, because uh, the, the cheap receivers have had trouble dealing with it through sunrise, sunset kind of times, or even daytime kind of thing. I think the idea is to get them to the place where they can receive it. So it's just a performance day. issue and not, not so much like adding additional, I don't know, uh, information on the Yeah, there's some stuff on the additional information. Um, let's see if I have this still up over here. So basically, this just put out a nice document describing the new format. And so it's a new format. Is it really recent? Yeah, it's, it's, this was 2013. They tested it a little in 2012, and they put this on in 2013. So basically, the idea is the way they're doing it is it's still got the old AMPWM, but what they'll do is put a phase shift in here, just like in 0.1 seconds into the bit. So it's still one bit per second. But the, if the phase shift is going to occur, it's a, it's a differential BPSK. So if the phase shift's going to occur, it'll be right here, and that signal's a 1. And if there's no phase shift, the signal's a 0, basically. Um, and that's, that way, it doesn't mess with the older receivers, theoretically. It does, it does mess with people who are using um, carrier tracking to just use a very stable 60 kilohertz reference. This kind of messes with them if they've got a, just a, a simple PLL that is tracking it. But uh, that, that's, 
that's the, the basics of what they put in. Um, and then there's, there are some other message formats. I guess I saw in here it was talking about other message formats. It's still one bit per second and still one minute for the frame. So I pretty new. It caused a lot of chaos on time nuts for a while with people who had the, the some of the older equipment that was doing the carrier phase tracking. What are the next steps for you now and how do people get in touch if they want to contribute to your project? So definitely the way to get in touch with me is I'll, I'll put the slide, you know, definitely do the slides, drop me an email. Um, I will be posting on the new radio mailing list, so watch out there. Um, some of the stuff that we're going to on GitHub. So, um, next steps are, I mean, I'm going to go back to working on my receiver. <laughs> That's what I want to get working. Uh, the actual, like, the antenna, getting an appropriate sound card. But what is that uh, sound card function that uh, was simply connected to uh, an antenna? Uh, yeah, with an impedance match, basically. Uh, you can put a little bit of active gain in there, but it's, it shouldn't be necessary. It's all, it's all in how, like, how high a few antenna you want. Like, so I'd like to start playing with some other things in this also. Like there's heart rate monitors down at 5 kilohertz, so that'd be kind of fun to see if we can pick those up. Um, there's, there's a bunch of other things in the long wave band, but it, if you get a high Q antenna, then you get stuck with needing to change your tune. I'm remembering antenna. from a back uh, like prior to that, probably a junior high or senior high school age, and uh, uh, one of those kits for a uh, crystal radio, where I was able to use for that antenna, I was just connecting to the one lead of a phone line, mm -hmm. and so that might save a little bit of antenna work for those yeah. people who didn't haven't had their uh, phone lines removed. Well. So I'm interested in going the direction kind of Ian hinted at a little bit. I mean, I don't mind building a big antenna initially, but I'd like to work on something in the smaller end of things. And I mean, do, but, yeah. some places haven't had their phone lines cut mm -hmm. down yet. Sure. That would be available. Absolutely. Yep. That would definitely be a possibility to do a long wire like that. Can you clarify, you said sound cards, you said that uh, the one that you have is a 48K. Can you clarify that the distinction when it's a function versus the IRA card? The, clarify the distinction of what? Sorry? Whether or not you were successful with a 48K card. So, so there's a problem with some of the sound cards. So I wasn't successful with a 48K card, even though I should have been able to get something there, um, just with aliasing, right? I mean, obviously it's not, I'm going to be undersampling relative to 60 kilohertz. Uh, but actually, the, the recording that I was using there is is done that way, right? It was actually done at 44. Do you, do you need to oversample relative to the carrier or to the to the modulated uh, waveform? Yeah, you need to oversample relative to the to the modulated waveform. But the problem with a lot of sound cards is they use um, for for their analog to digital converter, they'll use a delta sigma a lot of them, and so you're basically the the, the higher order aliases are out in the the noise portion of what the delta sigma is doing. So you, you don't really get a signal that's going to alias down the you. And, and that's more or less my understanding of what I ran into that with mine. Um, so direct sampling is what more people tend to do. Uh, it's all what kind of card you have. If you, have, if you know you have an, 
um, a sound card that's like a SAR ABC, then you can totally alias it in. It should be fine if there's not front end filtering, like anti alias filters on your sound card. Okay. Oh, I don't know Android devices. You said you want to run these on an Android mm -hmm. device. But don't you have more problems with that? There could be more problems. There are definitely some that have high end, you know, higher end sound cards in them. Um, I'm actually kind of thinking about going the route of uh, a little, there's, there's plenty of little like ARM microcontrollers, again, an ARM M0 or whatever, that'll have a, a 500 millisample a second AVD on it, and then you can use that as your peripheral through the USB interface. So there's, a, there's folks up in Canada doing a very uh, slow Morse code at 160 kilohertz. Do you, do you think you could like, Subsample that. Again, it's going to depend on your card, um, but I would like to. I'd like to see a kit out there for that kind of thing, for sure. The AVR works really well for um, for sampling the uh, CMAX antenna. Sorry, what does? An, an AVR. It, okay. Its internal ABC is fast enough. Exactly. Yep. Having built such a thing before. Cool. So you could do SDR using a Arduino. Yeah, exactly. Actually, you can find that if you, if you search for it, there's already WCD <coughs> shields for Arduino. You know, this is DIY. Yep. And if you want to be crazy, you get the Ethernet shield for the Arduino. <laughs> now and you, you put an NTP server. server on your Arduino. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I want to play with the new radio. That's kind of my motivation here. Yeah. So, but yeah, I could definitely see using um, using the USB stack on an Arduino to pull the data into to get new radio that way. Any, any more questions? Oh, all right, let's thank Jason. <laughs> Does anybody have any, any quick announcements they'd like to make before we wrap up? I got one. Yes. I uh, just received my uh, Novena open source laptop with the Myriad RF uh, SDR board, so if people want to take a look at that. I'm in the process of that getting installed all of the software. Oh, cool. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming along tonight. Thanks everyone for coming along tonight. And um, let's thank. Is Harvin still here or is he might have gone? He left. He left? All right. Well, let's, um, in spirit, thank Harvin and uh, Jason once again. Have a very pleasant evening and a good month and hope to see you next time in the South Bay.